And there was a corral gate there, and I grabbed hold of that. Didn't do any good. I didn't have any strength. And for four hours, I was out there in that hot sun, unable to get up. I lost my hat. So I was out, out there in, in that hot sun, bareheaded. And for about four hours, I was hollering help to the neighbors. Now, if, you, if you, some of you have been to my place, and you know that my neighbors are not right next door. And uh, since it was so hot, they were probably in the house. They're retired. So they're probably in the house, in, a, in their air-conditioned house. And I got no response. And then I thought, hey, I'm yelling for help to the wrong people. So I prayed to God. And within 15 minutes, I was sitting up. Within another 15 minutes, I was standing up. And then I was walking to the house. Don't forget that God is our helper. And then a couple weeks later, another storm came by. And I ended up in the hospital. But that time I remembered to pray. And God took care of that problem too, even though I was in the hospital. Because the doctors and the nurses took care of me. The ones that God prepared to do that. This song is called Till the Storm Passes By. And it's a prayer. The whole song is a prayer. It's written by a gentleman named Mosey Lister. And I'm, I'm not sure when, but it's been a while. And I'm going to try to sing it. In the dark of the midnight, have I all hid my face while the storm howls above me? And there's no hiding place Mid the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe till the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever from the sky Hold me fast, let me stand In the hollow of thy hand Keep me safe till the storm passes by Many times Satan whispered There is no need to try for there's no end of sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise, where the storm never darkens the sky.
When the long night has ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in my presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, Till the clouds roll forever from the sky Hold me fast, let me stand In the hollow of thy hand Keep me safe till the storm passes by Don't forget God like I did. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is good to have you here. <clears throat> and, and Jim, I, I know why he wouldn't let you sing it a month ago. I appreciate you bringing that song here to us today. Thank you so much. We live in a world that's in the grasp of sin. The world. We live in a world that's ultimately controlled and overseen by God. And yet we have struggles, we have storms, we have problems. Today's message is entitled, A Second Chance for a First Impression. It is rare in life, if ever, we have a second chance for a first impression. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to start in chapter 12. We're going to move around a little bit. And I'd like to invite you to stick with me on this journey. Because it's not going to go perhaps in the direction that you're going to think is going to sound real good. Trust me, we will get to the place where it sounds absolutely perfect because it's God's plan. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, as we study from your word, help us to see that you are clear, you are concise, you are faithful, you are in control. And most of all, Father, great is your faithfulness. Help us to move through this. I pray that it will dispel perhaps the wrong understanding and that we will see the truth. I ask for your spirit, the one that instructed the writers of the Bible, I pray that it will instruct us. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I am going to start in <clears throat> verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says this. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. 
lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meal sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, in other words, when he wanted it, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I want to read another version of that last verse. This comes from God's Word translation. That was from the King James. You know that afterwards, when he wanted to receive the blessing that the firstborn son was to receive, he was rejected. Even though he begged and cried for the blessing, he couldn't do anything to change what had happened. How's your life today? How's everything going? As you look around the world, do you see things that might be falling apart around you? As you look at your life, do you see things that you've done and you wish you hadn't done them? And then do you look to God and you wonder, I don't hear an answer to prayer. I don't see a result. And as God waits to respond, and sometimes God waits to respond, Jesus was asleep in the boat when they were crossing. When he woke up and the water was pouring into the boat and they wondered why he was sleeping and letting them drown, Jesus didn't turn to them right away and answer their question. He turned to the problem and said, peace be still, and it was still. Sometimes in our lives we have problems. Sometimes in our lives we can even remember that we did something and the natural consequence for doing what we've done isn't a consequence that we'd want to have. Here was Esau. We know the story. We're going to look at it in a minute, maybe. But Esau came in from the field hungry. And he sold his birthright for a bowl of of stew. Have we done that? Do we understand that God offers us a birthright in heaven? Not Niagara Falls, not Houston, Texas. He offers us eternal life in heaven. That's the offer that Christ has made. That's what's available to us. And yet Esau had gotten to the place where he had forfeited that birthright. He thought more of the soup than he did of God helping him. And he made a poor choice. But his understanding of God, and I don't want you to miss this, was of a God who when you make a bad choice will hold that bad choice against you forever. And sometimes when we have that understanding of God, we work our whole life trying to appease and please God. We look at the sacrifice that Jesus made, and we look at that sacrifice as what he had to do to please this angry God that was in heaven. And he felt that he was going to have to put up with what he had done. He was not sorry that he chose the soup. He was sorry that he gave up something that now it appeared he couldn't get back. But I want us to understand something. He had that understanding because he didn't understand God. When we have a correct understanding of God, we won't allow that story in the Bible to cause us to think that we've gone too far away from God. We won't believe that God is this tyrant who's angry, who wants to receive a sacrifice. We're told in the Bible that's not what he even wants at all. 
Go with me if you would, and we're going to come back to Hebrews later as well, as well as Romans, but go with me if you would, because I want you to see this text in 1 Peter. 1 Peter in chapter 1, near the back of the Bible, written by the man who told Jesus that he would never leave him nor forsake him. That everybody else could leave, but he would never leave. Again, a total misunderstanding of the character of God. A man who had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. A man who thought he knew to trust Jesus. And Jesus explained to him that he would turn and run away. And this man wrote this book, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 13 is where we will start. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. This is Peter talking. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we talk about grace in the Bible, and it's all over Scripture. And we are saved by grace. So don't miss the grace that Jesus wants to bring into your lives. Don't have the wrong picture of this God who died on the cross that we might live. That is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Beloved, we need to see Jesus Christ as who he is. Not as who Satan wants us to think. Or not as we in our broken character want to bring God down to our level. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. We are broken people, aren't we? We have a broken character. We, we have a bent <clears throat> towards giving in to temptation. And we serve a God who knows who we are. He knows the thoughts in our mind and our hearts. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That means how you live, how you talk, what you read, what you watch. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now we could do a whole Bible study on holy. But I want you to understand that we serve a God who says that he is holy. And yet we try to give him a character like ours. And God wants us to see him as he is so that we can see what he wants to do in us. Don't miss what I just said. So that we can see what he wants to do in us. It's his job. He's the one who's going to bring it to pass. And sometimes we don't see that God. I'm reading that again because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Number one is a call for holiness that Jesus has made. And number two, the contrast for holiness is the life of Esau. And so we need to understand why that was written for us. Because you see, there was this contrast between Esau and Jacob in the very beginning. And Esau was at least honest about what he wanted. Jacob lied. Jacob deceived. But Jacob wanted something so badly for the wrong reason and with the wrong aspirations that he was willing to lie. He was willing to sell or coerce Esau for selling his birthright, which gave him a higher place and he was willing to deceive his father. As you read the story, he literally lied stubbornly, insubordinately, out loud to his father, who asked specific questions. Both of them started out in the wrong place. But Esau's understanding of God 
never changed. Because Esau continued in his own self-serving, selfish ambitions to guide a life that required a God to accept him like he was and get over it. And Jacob, when he went through the, crucif- the, the, the problems, crucible of affliction, God's glory is to lay man's glory in the dust. Now, in the world, we look at that statement and we say, oh, God's going to put us down. No, no. God's glory is that he's loving and kind, long-suffering and patient, merciful, forgiving, and he can maintain justice. And still at the same time, forgive. And so God's glory is that he's divine. And our glory is that we're selfish and broken. And God's goodness is to lay that glory in the dust so that we can trust God for his glory. And God takes what's broken and makes it perfect if we will let him. And so here's Esau. He's struggling Turn with me to Genesis. I want to go through the story of Jacob and Esau. Genesis chapter 25. I'm going to start in verse 29. Genesis 25, starting in verse 29. And again, if you have trouble with these scriptures, you let me know. I'll give you a copy of them at the end. It helps when we read and hear and speak God's word. Sometimes... That's a little more difficult to do, and it may not be as practical. Genesis 25, verse 29 is where we'll start. It says, And Jacob sawed pottage, which means he was cooking soup. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. In other words, he was hungry. And he comes in, and Esau's cooking, and you know what happens when something's being cooked that smells good. You smell it, you want it, and he was hungry. And so he said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. I want to make this point. Esau came in and he said something to Jacob. He said, I want what you've got because I'm tired or I'm hungry or I want it. You don't have to go to God and explain why you want him to come to you. You just have to cry out. But Esau thought that he needed to earn that pottage. For I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. Now, doesn't that seem a little bit dramatic? Do you notice how we get real dramatic when we want to convince God that we really need the new car, the new boat, the new whatever, or the new kitten? God wants us to pray to him. But the prayer that he will answer always and immediately is the prayer to overcome the temptation for sin. His purpose was to come and seek and save the lost. And if he's coming to save the lost, all we need to do is say, hey, like Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. He already knows. But his purpose is to make available to us the power that only he has. And we need to understand it's his desire to give us that power. And he goes on, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I want us to understand that as Esau came, he really didn't value the birthright. He valued gratification, instant gratification. He he valued having a personal request granted. 
He was very selfish and self-centered and beloved because of our brokenness. We can all be that way. And it says after he ate the meal, now he's full. Well, he was dying before, right? So he was willing to sell the birthright, but now he's full. He didn't even ask for it back. His life did not indicate that the birthright was something he wanted. My question to us today is, does ours? Does our lifestyle, does our action, do our words, what we watch, what we think, does it show a desire for the birthright that Jesus wants us to have? The story is a short one. The birthright was a singular significance. It indicated favor and community with God. It was instituted by God in a patriarchal system where the one who became the patriarch was also supposed to become the priest of the home, was supposed to lead them in the way everlasting. What a glorious right that God wanted to bestow in each family so that the understanding of God would never change. The patriarch of the home was to care for everyone in it, to supply the needs, to teach them scripture, to bring them to an understanding of a God that loved them so much he wanted them all in heaven with them. It signified family headship as the patriarch and a double portion of wealth, power, and resources from the estate. In the patriarch of the family, the estate belonged to God. And he was entitled to a double portion of God's spirit and God's power. He was entitled to come to God and lay everything out at his feet and lead his family again on a path to heaven. Well, the lentils were one meal. And for one meal, he sold all of that because he didn't value it. That was the value Esau placed on the birthright. Heaven is forfeited for mere temporary pleasure. Christ is ridiculed for self-indulgent pleasure and drama. The way to eternal life is so straight to some people as they look at the requirements that they reject it. What a depressing reality as we look at our lives if that's the focus that we have on heaven. I went through all of this because I want to set the tone and the stage for us to understand we are in this dark place. And if left to ourselves, that would be the end of the story. But I want to share something else with you today. I want to share the good news. I want you to see the gospel and what God is really like. And I want you to see what he wants us to have and what he truly offers. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah. We're only going to read three scriptures there, but Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31, please come with me because I want you to see something. I want you to see that we're going to talk a little bit today about the old covenant and the new covenant. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. <coughs> Jeremiah is a prophet. Jeremiah is a prophet that God has inspired to, pe to speak to the children of Israel, his people, the ones that he eventually will come and die for. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31, it says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I want to stop right there for a second. 
Jeremiah, the prophet of God, admits to the people that God had made an old covenant. He made that covenant when he brought them out of the land of Israel. Now, at that point, <clears throat> where was the sanctuary located when he brought them out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt? Who knows? Where? Say it louder. Like you're, like you're proud of it and you're positive. Heaven. Do we understand that? The sanctuary was in heaven when he brought them out of Egypt. Did they know God? Easy answer. They couldn't. They'd been 400 years living in the world. They didn't know God, but they saw the power of God. They saw the deliverance of God. And I want you to get this point. They knew the story of the flood, so they'd seen the power of God. They saw the people died, but remember, they didn't focus on the eight that he brought through. The children came out of Israel, or out of Egypt, and when they came out, they brought a large multitude from Egypt. The Egyptians wanted to be with this God who had the power, this God who brought the plagues, this God who led them and parted the Red Sea. Now, if that's all you know and see of God, what would you think of God? You'd think just what Esau thought. So God knew that he needed to bring a presence down to the children of Israel so that they could see God in a new light. Is that not true? And so he talked with Moses. He brought them to Mount Sinai. He talked to Moses. He said, build me a sanctuary that I may do what with you? Dwell with you. So Moses built a sanctuary on this earth as a type so that the people could get to understand God. The problem was that everybody brought sacrifices. And day after day after day after day, because they sinned, they kept bringing sacrifices. Now, there were some who got it. I'm, I'm not saying everybody didn't. But most didn't. And as a result, the picture they had of God warped what they thought God wanted and caused fear in their lives to keep them from coming to him. But that was the purpose of Jesus bringing the sanctuary down to this earth and showing Moses what had to happen. And those people who studied the sanctuary saw a picture of God that caused them to change. So let's finish this. Then Jacob... <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days after the days when the sanctuary has been brought down, <clears throat> after the days of the wilderness, and I will put my law in their inward parts. Who's going to do it? Do you understand? It's God's work. And write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, I hear a lot of times when we talk about him being our God, what do we say? We say he's our, tell me what he is. I can't hear you. Father. Is that what you said? Father's good. What? Savior? Okay. That's the one I was waiting to hear. I want to hear one more. Mediator's good too, but that's still self-centered and selfish. What else? What? Friend, that's also selfish because I pick my friends. Creator. Creator's good. That gives him the right and the privilege. Beloved, he is our God. Redeemer and Lord. Lord. Is he not the Lord of your life? Yes. We didn't say it. And neither did Esau. Do you see it? We, we lose sight of it. In, in, the, in the good gifts that God gives, we lose sight of the fact that he's Lord of our life. We lose, we lose sight of the fact that 
He has to be Lord of our life because if he's not Lord of our life, we're lost. He just redeems us every day. But we live the same every day. But he's the one who's going to do the job. If he's the Lord of our life, will he direct our steps? If he's the Lord of our life, will he watch over us and care for us? Yes. He will come and seek and save that which is lost. And to be that, what does it mean to be God? All those other answers you gave are absolutely true. But unless you put in the last part, unless you know God and see God for who he is, it's very difficult, very difficult to trust him. We must understand that he's the Lord of our lives. He is the king of the universe. He is the protector of our souls. Not just a savior who does that 24-7 for eternity. Because there's a time when he stands up, isn't it? And if we serve this God who is loving and gracious and long-suffering and perfect, God is love. And perfect love casts out all fear. If that's who God is, then don't we want him to be Lord of our lives? But there's so often in this world we're caused to doubt. But God wants us to understand. He wants us to come to him. And it says, he will be our God. And we shall be his people. Now look at this. In the Old Testament, this is, it will be ratified by the blood of Jesus because at this point in Jeremiah's day, where's the sanctuary? No, 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 you're right, but where's the sanctuary for us in Jeremiah's day? It's on this earth. It's a type to lead us to an understanding of God. And so Jeremiah is talking about this sanctuary and he's talking about this God who's in it. And fundamentally, in the middle of this sanctuary is the law of God. Who are we supposed to love with all our heart? Are we to have anybody before him? Are we to take his name in vain? Beautiful. And as we look at that, God says he's going to write that law on our heart. If we trust him to do it, we'll follow him. If we get to know him for who he is, we'll follow him. And this is what tells us who he is. It's not some pastor standing up talking for too long. I apologize ahead of time for going to be doing that. I hope not. But you don't listen to me. I mean, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to hear what I've said, compare it to this, and then do what this says. You may even have to come to me and say, Pastor, I think you missed it. I hope you love me enough to do that. But I want you to hear that this is what tells us about God. God wants us to be with him. This is, tells us what he's supposed to be like. And we're confused about who God is. We serve a God who loves us, a God who wants us to be his people. And Jesus promises it will be ratified. I don't want you to miss that. And it has always been guaranteed to be the works of Christ. Do you get that? Jesus is going to ratify it. There's going to be a new covenant. But right now, it's the blood of bulls and goats. Because the sanctuary is still here on this earth. Do we understand? So we need to understand now. Let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Because we're going to try to bring this to a close in a circuitous way. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 says this, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Why? Because there was a problem with the old covenant. Do you know what the problem with the old covenant was? God said, If you obey, I will give you all these things. They said, We will do it. They couldn't do it. There was a fault, a problem with the old covenant. But he had to demonstrate to them that they couldn't do it, so that he could demonstrate to them that he could. And so here they've made this new covenant promise of something to come, a better promise. 
You'll see the contrast. Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the contrast. That was the old covenant. Now I want to show you the new covenant. Verse 10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Do you see the difference between the old and the new covenant? In the old covenant, they were on their own. Not because God thought they could do it. They couldn't. But the new covenant, they became God's prized, protected, chosen, called people. And so Jesus promised for those people to make a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. I'm going to jump around a few. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Who obtained the more excellent ministry? Jesus. Jesus. Because Jesus now isn't leaving it up to us. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Do you understand in Hebrews... Paul is telling them that Jesus has finally changed the covenant. He never changed the purpose. The purpose was that he was going to write the law in their hearts. But I want you to see this. It was ratified now by the blood of Jesus. Before it was a promise. But now it's been ratified by the blood of Jesus. And the Bible tells us if God gave us his son, what would he withhold? We now have the storehouse of heaven opened up for us because we are the children, brothers, and sisters of God. Because Jesus came down and died a death because he loves us so much, he doesn't want us to have to struggle and do this on our own when we can't. And he has proven his love by his actions on the cross. It isn't God that's been the problem. But Esau never knew that God. And so, beloved, today I want you to learn about that God. I want you to know that God so clearly that your mind changes about how good he is. And as we fall in love with him, we allow him to be not just the redeemer, not just the creator, not just all of this other stuff that gives him a legal right to us, but our Lord, where we give him our heart's right to be that for us. Because, beloved, when we give him our heart, when we give him our heart, he will never let us down. But we have to give him our heart. So we have to know and learn about Jesus. We have to see this Jesus. We have to lose this idea that Jesus hates us somehow or requires us to serve him or pay him back for what he's done. This now is guaranteed by the works of Jesus. It was that in the Old Testament. But now it's been ratified by his blood. We need to understand that Jesus wants to do the work completely and totally in us. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says this. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In that he said, a new covenant he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Beloved, there is no legal way to get to heaven. There is only through the grace of God by faith that we can go. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. A few pages over. Verse 24. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Do you understand what the contrast is in that verse? I want you to get this. In Genesis, when Abel died, what did God say about his blood? That it cried out for what? Vengeance. Do you understand? The blood of Abel cried out from the ground for vengeance. 
Is that what the blood of Jesus does? Absolutely not. I don't even want you to consider it. But the sprinkling of the blood of Christ cries out for mercy. So the sprinkling of the blood of the new covenant is far greater and far more important than the blood of the old. And we come to a God who wants us to have a relationship with him that is so close we'll never be separated for eternity. That's a pretty good deal from a God who's a really cool God. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 1 through 10. A long reading, but I want you to get it. It kind of brings it all together. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. In other words, if you keep coming bringing that same sacrifice to the sanctuary that is on the earth, you get that? Because where's the sanctuary when they're bringing sacrifices? On the earth. Where's the sanctuary today? Is there any doubt? Do you understand? The sanctuary today is in heaven. How do we know that? Because Jesus sits at the right hand of God mediating for us. Beloved, when the sanctuary on earth took the sins in, what had to happen every year? Had to be cleansed. Do you get that? It had to be cleansed. But now the blood of Christ allows our petitions to go straight to God. The promise has been fulfilled the covenant is still the same. It's God's work. He'll do it in us. It didn't change. But now he's in heaven. Why? Because he died. And now he serves in heaven, mediating his blood for us. Before it was just by faith. He hadn't died. We by faith believed he was coming. But today we know he has. And Jesus himself said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you, and you will be with me where I am. Esau never got that. Esau never understood. We need to understand who God is, and we can't take man's description of him or the world's understanding of what's good, nice, pretty, and sweet. Verse 2, for then would they have need, they would have ceased to be offered, Right? They would have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged would have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there was a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou would not have, but a body hast thou prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin those you had no pleasure then said I lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O God I need to ask you a question before we go on to the last two or three verses what is the will of God John 17 17 right that's the will of God. Sanctify them by their truth. Thy word is truth. That's Jesus knows God's will is that we would be sanctified. But what does that mean? I want you to get the total import of that. I really don't want you to miss it because I think this is a huge point of understanding who God is. God died not to appease the Father who was angry. God died. Jesus died because that was the way to bring us to heaven. Not because he had to please somebody, not because he had to pay a price, but because it was the only way that he could gain entrance into our heart so completely. He didn't want to live without us. I don't want you to miss that. This, this Old Testament, New Testament, this is a harsh God, this is a love. No, God from before the foundation of the world, put in place a plan to save us. That's his will. I, his will is to save us and bring us to heaven. And to be saved, we've got to be holy like he is holy. But it's his work. 
So we don't need to fight about this. We just need to understand that if the God who created the heavens and the earth wants to bring us somewhere, pretty good chance he's going to get it done. But we can't keep fighting him. We have to see him for who he is, the Lord of our lives. I've struggled as I try to prepare messages that make sense, that will draw us to a picture that the Bible gives of a God who loves so deeply and completely, he won't let you go. And then I struggle with the fact that I'm not perfect. But he says, I'm supposed to be. And it's his job to bring that about. And that's the glory of God putting my glory in the dust that I somehow think that I'm perfect or that I can attain. But beloved, if we allow God to be God, he will attain it. And his will be the glory, not mine. And I will be humble, not proud. And so this is what the will of God is all about. That he can bring back what's been broken and taken away from him. And he's asking us for permission to do it. He wants to work for each one of us. The law can't do it. It is only through a relationship with him. It is written of me to do thy will, O God, above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for in thou would not neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law then said he lo I come to do thy will O God he takes away the first that he may establish the second by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all now I, I don't want you to miss this I'm making too many points. I'm going to try to finish up pretty quick. We try too hard to define justification and sanctification. We try too hard. One without the other does not exist. Is that pretty plain? One without the other doesn't exist. So you don't get one and then get the other. If Jesus justifies you, it says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you, right? From all your trespasses. And then to do what? Cleanse you from sin. So if you're justified, you're cleansed. If you're cleansed, you're sanctified. That doesn't mean that you won't slip. But it means that when God justifies you, he also works sanctification. As you look through this, Sanctification, justification, holiness are used interchangeably in the work that Jesus is trying to do in you. It's a complete work. It's a whole work. And it's not just part of this and part of that. Beloved, if we would surrender, he would win. And that's where it needs to go. If we would surrender, he would win. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We're justified when he died. We're also sanctified by his body. This was the situation we were in, according to Paul in Romans. Romans 5, 6 through 10. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God come, commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. You see how he goes back and forth? We shall be saved from wrath through him. To be saved, we've got to be justified and sanctified. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, reconciliation is justified, now more being reconciled, we shall be saved or sanctified by his life. I come to a close. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's good news. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 11. 
But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or raise you from the dead, your mortal bodies, by his spirit that dwells in you. We are justified by his blood. We are sanctified by his life. We are called to be holy like he is holy. It is all his work. It is still, however, our choice. I want to tell you a story in closing. Back in the history of our nation, there was a situation that was not good. It was evil. It wasn't a good choice. It was not a good look, but it still exists in our history, and it was called slavery. In that system that existed back in our history, there was a man named Chicken George. Anybody here heard of Chicken George? Chicken George was a slave, but he had a special talent. There was another thing that was going on back in our history, and that was called cockfighting, or where the roosters fight one another to the death, and they bet on the outcome of which rooster is going to live. Chicken George could train the best fighting roosters in the United States, famous for it. And the man that Chicken George was a slave of, liked Chicken George, and he and Chicken George made a lot of money. One day, there was a, an invitation that came from across the ocean. In that invitation, there was a British gentleman who was going to take on all comers. Now, Chicken George and the owner talked, and they decided to accept that invitation. The man came over, the fight was on. Chicken George had saved up a penny here and, and a, a nickel there, and he'd worked for years, and he asked the man who owned him if it would be okay if he bet his own money, because if he bet his own money and won, he could buy his freedom. He could be free. The man said, certainly. He had appreciated what Chicken George had done. He said, certainly. So now Chicken Do George had one more here hurdle to get over. He had to convince his wife that they should gamble the money they'd saved, and if they lost it, they'd never get their freedom. But if they won, they could be free right now. She said, no, 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 no. Chicken George bet the money anyway. They put the roosters on the ground, and Chicken George is going, boy, this is, this is one of my best. And in the end, Chicken George's rooster won. And the guy from Britain's rooster lay dead on the ground. And can you imagine the joy that Chicken George had? He's running around, we're free, we're free, we're finally free. The man from Britain says, mm, I've got one more rooster, you want to go double or nothing? Now you've got to understand, Chicken George was free. His wife was going to be free. They had enough money to pay for their freedom. And that man from Britain says, ah, no, I mean, if you don't think your rooster can do it. He says, we'll do it. We'll do it. So they put the roosters down. And yes, you know the answer to the story. In the end, this time it was Chicken George's rooster that lay dead on the ground. Beloved, do you want to be free? Free from the sin and the bondage in your life? Because Jesus, when you come, will forgive you and cleanse you.
Now the question is, do you love the freedom more? Because Chicken George, Chicken George wanted to fight chickens more than he wanted to be free. Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. Great is your mercy. The blood of Christ cries out mercy. The sanctuary in heaven delivers that mercy. The covenant that we have is that you will do the work. You will provide the power. You will provide the deliverance. You will make us free. Do we see you for who you are? Do we see your incredible love and the purpose for your intervention because you have a, a thought for us, a plan for us, one of deliverance, one of mercy? You tell us you desire us to be with you. You do all things to make that happen. Father, move us past the misdirection. Move us past the misunderstanding of your character, your goodness, and your love for us. Help us. We need you to be the Lord in our lives. You have promised to work in our hearts to make us willing to be willing. Father, have your own way with us. And then come soon. Let your glory light the world as it takes the place of man's glory. Light the world, Father. And come and bring us home. Let us look up one day and say, my God, my God, as we rise into the sky and into your presence, never to be separated from you again. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.